Uh, before I actually go into the message, I want to just share with you what I shared with our first service and our second service, is that as I was preparing this message, I ran out of time, to be honest with you. Uh, so I was going through the historical background of the message, and basically that's all I have for you today. So historical background is what you're going to get today. You're not going to get much actually from the text, uh, but you're, at least when you read the text on, for your, for your, on your own, you'll be able to have a lot of that historical background for you to understand it on your own. Amen? Man, can, can you say amen? Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. and, and you know, by the way, I, I know we're a few, um, and I've been in ministries like this in the past uh, where we started with just a few, um, and God has been good to, uh, to me in my life personally and to the ministry that I was at, and they continue to grow uh, physically, so very thankful for that. Uh, but I'm very used to response, you know, um, not just me preaching, but uh, the congregation to respond. You could say whatever you want, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I don't mind, uh, actually. Um, the Korean congregation might mind, <laughs> but the English congregation, I don't mind at all. So if you feel like responding in any way, go ahead and do so. I know it gets a little awkward because there's not many people here, uh, but that is really like my style. Anyways, here we go. Uh, so yeah, uh, today is going to be historical background, and you might think, oh, that sounds boring. Uh, so I'm just going to go to sleep now. Do not do that, because I really think you're going to get something out of this if you are listening. All right, so. Uh, something that we all know, we know that for those who love God, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. Amen? Romans 8, 28. It's a very famous verse. If you don't know it, that's okay. You can know it now. You just heard it. It's an amazing verse. Let me say it again. We know that for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. Amen? That's an amazing verse. We say this verse, we know this verse, we memorize this verse, but when we are in the midst of struggles, when we are in the midst of hardship, bad things are happening in our lives, it is not easy for us to admit that all things work together for good, right? It's not easy to admit that when things are breaking apart. Um, because all things really not only includes the good things in our lives, all things includes the bad things of our lives as, as well. And so in the middle of your crisis, my crisis, in the midst of our dilemmas of our lives, although it is hard to say all things work together for good, the truth of the matter is, and we can all testify to this, when we look back into our lives, back into my life, I know uh, for certain that if certain things did not happen in the past of my life, if certain things did not take place, I probably would not be here today. Right? We can all probably testify to that. If certain events and things didn't happen the way it did, I might not be here today in front of you. And so the question really isn't, why does God allow bad things to happen in my life? I know that's a very famous question. It's a question that we all might ask sometime in our life. Why does God allow bad things in my life? That's really not the question. But rather the real question is, how did God use that in my life, right, for his good purpose? Amen? Right? How? Right? It's not, you know, why? Why did God do this? No. How could he do this in a very awe-inspiring, so blown away kind of way, right? Uh, by how God not only did he, not only allowed, but how God used the terrible events in your lives, in your life. How God used the, that traumatic situation that you were going through, and you thought it's impossible. You thought this is it. You thought you're dead, but somehow God made a way where there seemed to be no way. Amen? Right? That's God. That's the Lord. When the whole people of Israel were standing before the Red Sea, they were like, oh, we're done. Right? He parted it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Right? Yeah, so yeah, he makes the impossible happen. He does that. Why? To make us, to mold us, to shape us, to be who I am today. More specifically, actually, the more spiritually proper is that he's making us, he's molding us, he's shaping us to be more like his son, Jesus. So that's what's amazing about uh, what God does in our lives. And if you look at every one of these characters in the Bible, every person in the Bible, every one of them went through crazy situations. I don't know one person in the Bible that had a, a normal life. Everybody went through crazy situations, yet all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. All of them, right? So I can say amen to that. Listen, the cross, the cross, we know the cross, Jesus, that cross, is truly the perfect definition of Romans 8 verse, uh, verse 28. 
The cross is the perfect definition of Romans 8.28. All things work together for good. That's the cross. All things work together for good. That's the cross. Looking at Jesus' situation, you know his life. You might not know exactly word for word if you haven't studied the word, but you know his life. If I tell you this, you heard about this. Nothing looked good, very good, or any good at all in Jesus' life. The religious leaders, his own people, the Jewish religious leaders, were out to get him. They were constantly after him. They were looking to find him, to arrest him, to get him killed. Right? Not only the religious, Jewish religious leaders, but also the government, the Roman leaders, officials. They were constantly watching him, keeping a close eye on him, because he was considered a rebel in that empire. Right? So they were constantly looking to see well, how they can capture him and put him in jail. His own disciples, think about his own disciples. None of them understood clearly what he was saying. How frustrating and frustrated could that be, right? I, even with me and my kids, and I'm trying to tell them something, they're not getting it. That can get very frustrating. But Jesus' disciples are not little kids. They're full-grown adults, yet they're not understanding him. And one of them in our passage today is getting ready to sell him, to kill him, right? To, to sell him away, to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. That's Jesus' life. On top of all that... Think about Jesus' family. Do you remember that one time when his family, they didn't, his brothers didn't believe him. Instead, they, tried to kick, they kicked him out of the house. They tried to push him over a cliff. So they kicked him out. That's Jesus' life, right? Ultimately, what happened for, in Jesus' life? Not only all of those things, ultimately Jesus is nailed and crucified on the cross. Jesus is nailed and crucified, and yet God... As you and I know today, we can say sing hallelujah and praise, and praise the Lord because it's in the past. We see in hindsight. Yet God, we know, it's not in hindsight. He, from eternity past, God had a plan in the midst of what seems to be impossible in our eyes. God made a way, right? And if Jesus wasn't crucified on the cross, brothers and sisters, really, you and I are doomed. <laughs> We're doomed. I mean, actually, literally doomed. If Jesus didn't die on the cross, if that event didn't happen, we are going to hell literally. And I'm not trying to curse at you. That's just a matter of fact. That's what the Bible teaches us. And all of this is working together, even in Jesus' life, for the good of his purpose and in our lives. And listen, that's only half the story. I, I hope you're still, still with me. I hope you got everything I just said. And so now we come to our passage today. That was just introduction. And the passage that we all might know as... A passage called, um, that's talking about the Lord's Supper, right? Or the Last Supper. We all know the, that great big picture, right? The, the, the drawing. And Jesus and his disciples are looking for a place, as we read in, the, in our passage, to observe the week-long festival of the unleavened bread. And ultimately, at the end of that festival, we know that it's the, the festival of Passover, right? Passover is really what they're preparing for. Now, what is the Passover feast? And you really need to listen to this. The feast of the Passover is still being observed today. Yes, even today by conservative Jews and Orthodox Jews here in this country and obviously in Israel and all around the world. Um, and the Jews celebrated the Passover because it commemorated the night when Moses led the Hebrew people out of Egypt and out of Egyptian slavery, 400 years of slavery, as we find in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. And as you know, I think you know the story pretty well, it was the final plague of the ten plagues. Remember God brought down ten plagues upon Egypt? Uh, the final plague where the people were saved by the blood of the lamb. Remember that? And the firstborn is killed. Firstborn is killed. When the destroyer, as we read in our Bible, the destroyer, as it is called in the book of Exodus in my ESV, or as my son's children, or my daughter's children's picture Bible, it says the death angel. That's what it says. The death angel began to fly over Egypt that night on the 10th plague, right? And all of the household of Israel who believed, in other words, there might not have been some who believed, I don't know, but all who believed what Moses instructed them to do, Right, God gave Moses instruction for the people. They painted, they painted the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, right, and the lintel, right. They painted the blood of the lamb, brushed it over their houses, and as the destroyer, the death angel, flew through the night into the streets of Egypt, and, 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 um, and when he saw the blood, when he saw the blood, he would pass over that, right. If he didn't see blood on that doorpost or on that on lintel, he goes into that house. And once he goes into that house, he'll take the firstborn out of that house. That's what happened all throughout the night 
in that first, on that tenth plague. Every house that did not have blood, you know the death angel stopped and he took a life. Once again, when the death angel, when the destroyer got to a house and tried to get in, but he saw the blood of the lamb, he would pass over that house, which is why it's called Passover, right? And they celebrated this Passover because, listen, they were saved because of the blood of the lamb. Such irony, isn't it? They were saved because of the blood of the lamb. Why can't they get that it's Jesus? <laughs> Amen? Right? Why can't they get that it's Jesus? But yeah, they don't get it. Now, why did the destroyer, listen, why did the destroyer, the, the death angel, pass over the house with the blood? Why? Well, the destroyer passed over the house with the blood not because of God's mercy. I know some commentators, biblical commentators say that. And it's not because they are forgiven. Or it's not because God is love. It's not all any of that. That's complicated. Listen, the death angel passed over that house because when he saw the blood, when he saw the blood, it's a sign that death had already been there. Right? That death had already been there. That's why the death angel passed over that house. Death was already there. So when he saw the blood, he passed right over now, what the death angel did not know or could not see, the death angel, was that it wasn't the people in the house that died, but it was the lamb that died for the house, right? It's the lamb that died for them so that the people in the house might live. Are you with me, right? That's the gospel. As I was studying for my doctorate, I was studying my pastoral counseling, I got to look deeper into disasters. That's where I focused my, uh, my, my studies. And uh, I, I studied um, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And after the hurricane, you know this, um, those of us who are old enough, we know this. And after the hurricane came uh, and did its major damage, right? I mean, it was the worst. Uh, the first responders came in, all right, after the hurricane uh, passed. And they would go to each house. All these houses are just in ruins. And to search, to search for survivors, right? To, to search for possibly even dead bodies. And after they had done their research in that house, whatever house that collapsed, after they had done everything, they would mark the outside of that house, indicating that the house was already searched so that no one else would waste their time in searching a house that's already been searched, right? That's already been searched. And now, now that's the same principle, right? We find thousands of years before in the book of Exodus, where when they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and on the lintels, that was a sign that death had already hit that house. The death angel did not need to come to that house again. Doesn't need to do that. And so through the blood of the lamb, as long as you were staying under the blood, staying in the blood, you will be saved. It's that simple, brothers and sisters. Now listen to this. I'm going to go a little bit further with this. When Moses met the Lord at the mountain, this is before uh, the whole incident. When Moses met the Lord for the first time at the mountain, he saw a burning bush, a burning bush. That was where Moses met the Lord, Yahweh God. And through that encounter with God, the Lord tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go, right? Let my people go. Now why did God want his people to be set free? God set his people so that they could be free to do anything? No. God set his people so that they could be uh, living in the promised land? Actually, that's not even the real reason. No, those aren't even the reason. God set his people free so that they would worship him in the wilderness. That was the reason that God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, right? So that they would be able to worship him in the wilderness, right? Exodus 8 verse 1. In other words, God set his people free so that they would encounter him, so that they would meet him. They need to meet him, that they would meet him, right? And so after the Passover incident, the Passover, the 10th plague and all that, after the Passover incident, Moses and God's people went through the wilderness and into the mount they went to the mountain that Moses met the Lord. And how long did it take? Exactly, the Bible tells us, 50 days. It took them from the time of Passover, the 10th plague, to get to the Mount Sinai, where, the mountain of God. It took them 50 days from Passover to, uh, to, uh, to Mount Sinai. And there, after 50 days, they see something. Do you know what they see? They see Exodus chapter 24, verse 17. That's what they see. I'm going to read it for you. The people saw the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain. That's what they saw. Now, that's, ES, that's my ESV translation. I looked at the, um, the original text. It's not just a fire on top of the mountain. It looked as if the mountain was on fire. That's what it looked like. Now watch this. It's no longer a burning bush on fire. It's the burning mountain on fire. 
You see what I'm saying? You see the parallel. No longer is it Moses at the burning bush, but now the entire people of Israel of God are standing before God before the burning mountain, right? We see this parallel. And there as they receive God's law, the Ten Commandments uh, there at Mount Sinai, that is where the Jews then and the Jews now celebrate the festival of the harvest. That's what they call it. Or in the Greek, they call it the festival of Pentecost. That's what they call it. It's getting interesting. Watch. It's getting interesting. 50 days after Passover into Pentecost, that's, that's, that's what they call it, right? Because they, that's when they first met the Lord. Fire with Moses, fire with God's people in the wilderness. We see the parallel. Now, Pentecost, it means 50 days. That's what Pentecost means. That's why it's called Pentecost. And so the Jews commemorate Pentecost or the Feast of Harvest as the time when they met the Lord Almighty God at Mount Sinai. Now, it, when I was thinking about it, it truly was a festival of harvest, wasn't it? Think about it. The Jews celebrated the festival of harvest because, uh, coincidentally, that was also the season of actual harvest, when their fruits and when their vegetables were in time of harvest. But the meaning behind the festival of harvest was when they first met God at the mountain. So, the people might call it the festival of, of harvest because they're harvesting, but it really is God's festival of harvest, right? The entire people gathered before God. So it was God's harvest time. Now, and so if the festival of the Pentecost is the harvest, as I was explaining to you, right, 50 days after, if the festival of uh, Pentecost is harvest, as the Bible tells us, then what is the Passover? If, if, the Pente if Pentecost is harvest, what is Passover? The Passover is the seed. Are you listening? It's the seed. I'm getting excited. <laughs> okay. All right, look. So by logic, in order to have the harvest, Pentecost, you need to have the seed, the Passover. That's basic gardening that I'm sharing with you. I love gardening. And so without, listen, so without the Passover seed, you cannot have Pentecost harvest. It's impossible. What, what we're trying to say here is, it is impossible to experience the harvest. It's impossible to experience fruit bearing in your life if you did not experience the Passover. If you did not experience the Passover. The Passover, brothers and sisters, the best definition of the Passover is the cross. No? You don't think so? Listen. The Passover, if, you were, if I were to tell any child who knows the Bible to, to, to draw a picture of the Passover, you know what they would draw? They're going to draw a house or like some kind of wooded place, and they would paint the, lamb of, the blood of the lamb on the wood. Right? That's the picture. It's a house, blood of the lamb on the house, right? That is the very picture of the cross, right? It's the blood of the lamb on wood. And so the point is, you must experience the cross to experience Pentecost. You need to experience the cross to experience Pentecost, to have harvest. In other words, the Passover had to happen in order to set in motion the Pentecost. Jesus had to die. His blood had to be shed on the cross, and Jesus had to be buried like a corn of wheat fallen to the ground, as we read from the Gospel of John. And exactly 50 days had passed, and as the clock started to tick from the Passover and on, from the cross, from the crucifixion, we know Acts chapter 2, right? Acts chapter 2. What happened in Acts chapter 2? Pentecost was going to happen. Acts chapter 2, the Jews gathered together to celebrate Pentecost. Right? And it's so crazy because if you think about it, because the cross, the crucifixion had happened, the clock started to tick. 50 days, the clock started to tick. It was inevitable. It's unstoppable, right? 
When they crucified our Lord Jesus Christ, the clock began to tick. When Jesus died on the cross, when Satan thought he won, when all the de devils and demons were celebrating because Jesus died on the cross, the clock began to tick. And we cannot forget that God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. That was his plan. This is God's plan from the beginning. But Satan had no idea that when Christ was crucified, when he ripped Jesus' body wide open, when he thought he caused death in Jesus, actually he brought life. He brought life and that clock started ticking. As a kid, I would go into the lawn of my father's house and, and pluck the dandelion flowers and I will blow it all around the lawn, right? And my dad would be like, don't do that, you idiot! Right? Because the moment I do that, what happened? I, you know, I thought I was killing the dandelion. Nope, I was spreading the dandelion all around uh, the lawn, right? And now my son and daughters do that, daughter do that. When Jesus was crucified, 50 days later, at the Feast of Pentecost, and it's, the, the Bible tells us that when Jesus died, it started the clock. 50 days later, Acts chapter 2, at the Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. And what else? Flames of what? Fire! There it is again! Interesting! Flames of fire! And through that encounter with God, that's the encountering with God, greater works began to break out amongst God's people. Acts chapter 2. No longer is it one man Jesus. Now God began to work through his children, man and woman, who are his people. It is the festival of harvest, Matthew 28. That's why he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? He tells us to do that, to go where? To the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth, to do what? To harvest. To harvest. Listen, Jesus, we know, has another name, and they call him Emmanuel. We know that, that, which means God with us, Matthew 1, verse 22 to 23. And yes, it is true that Jesus is God with us. It's true. But as Jesus was teaching his disciples, he said it in John chapter 14, verse 17. He said it there. He says this. Look, I paraphrase this. I am with you now. Yes, I am Emmanuel. That's what he's saying. I am with you now, but soon no longer will I be with you. I will be in you. Hallelujah. Right? I will be in you. God who is with us is now God who is in us. Brothers and sisters, we are the blood-washed, blood-washed sons and daughters of God. That's who we are. The blood is no longer on the door. The blood is no longer on a piece of wood. The blood flows in our bodies. That's called communion. The fire that burned that bush but did not consume it. I preached on it before. That fire is now in us and we shall not be consumed. We shall not be consumed just like that bush that was on fire but was not consumed. But we shall have eternal life in Christ. That's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God is telling you and me, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. So go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So brothers and sisters, do not contain, do not contain that fire that God has placed in your heart. Let that fire burn and let that passion continue on. Let the world know who Jesus is. And don't worry about your own life. You don't have to fear. Why? Because all things will work together for the good of those who love the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray.